Okay, let's get to these texts first, actually. Um, good morning to everybody. Thank you for sharing part of your Friday with me, either live or while watching the video. Because as you know, we progressively go through these ancient texts. And if you are regular with us, then you will get, I believe, a good understanding developed through regular readings of select texts that we talk about and that we try to explain historically and in context and then apply today. I can see why, um, you know, Trinitarians have basically collapsed. You know, they're basically done. I wrote an article, in fact, on the assumptions of Trinitarianism revisited <laughs> on my blog. I highly encourage you to read that. Direct response to James White and others, uh, including Dan Wallace and other people, grammatical arguments related to texts like Philippians 2. Oh, of course, I wrote a whole article on John 118. I mean, they're done. They have nothing. And I know I've been saying this a lot lately because it's been proven so often. And their inability to deal with texts involving Jesus and Michael and the things we talk about, sons of God. So, but I mean, watching the debates reminded me that they just, they, they, they have nothing. They haven't progressed at all. They still ask the same things, almost in the exact same ways. <laughs> no progress at all. Either way, I'll be uploading those debates in the next couple of weeks. They're longer and a different format, so it's just taking me a little longer, but lots of clips will be associated with them too. I'll put them in the debate playlist, and I may even uh, get a little bit more into things. Of course, as you know, Dr. Mori um, challenged me to write various things after our uh, radio discussion debate, and I did, and he never responded. <laughs> in fact, I found an email from him, I think it was 2014, the last email I got from him, where he basically just insulted me. <laughs> That's all they have. They're done. Maury had nothing. White has nothing, right? I mean, he hasn't responded to the Assumptions of Trinitarianism article that just point by point devastated most of their primary positions specific to White and other people. I mean, they can't even deal with Pliny's letter to Trajan properly. They just misunderstand and misuse the term God so often. It Primarily in the biblical texts, but I mean, even in Pliny's letter to Trajan, they can't even get that right. No, I mean, this it, it's kind of despair, uh, despairing because, as you know, because of a lot of these Trinitarian apologetic nuts and other non-Trinitarian apologetic nuts that just like to argue, they make the easiest text so difficult, like John 1.1. 1, 1. I mean, that's like such a simple text. And the same with Jesus in John 10, the way he talks about the gods. I mean, they're basically calling Jesus a polytheist. Uh, it's, it's disgusting. It's no wonder our society has basically collapsed under primarily Trinitarian religious leadership, right? I mean, they have consumed themselves so much with arguing and grammar that they have basically failed their society today, in large part, just like ancient Rome did when it became quote-unquote Christian and Trinitarian. It just dissolved into a disgusting cesspool of immorality, no doubt fueled in part by the lack of love coming from these apologetic nuts like Athanasius and these people that really just changed the whole course of doctrinal belief in a more formal way, that since that time, the apologetic nuts just can't get away. They can't, they don't have the intellectual capacity as we know, right? First John 5, 20, we don't need any counsel or creed to tell us further what's going on. They do. Without those creeds, without those counsels, without the earlier apologetic nuts. They have nothing. And all they have is the same things they've been arguing over since that same time. But I, I just was thinking about the other day, you know, these Trinitarians that love to argue and run around contradicting biblical texts. 
they they really damage society not just because of their ongoing involvement in debate the very things jesus didn't do it's like same with the scribes and pharisees right look at their society i mean they gave rise to herod the great <laughs> all these terrible people i'm sure they had some some decent folks like nicodemus but my point is as a society even though they were the religious leaders the scribes the pharisees worshiping jah they were collapsing spiritually they were dead just like these nuts today they're dead now they can wake up like jesus said but let the dead bury the dead right i mean if if they have been publicly exposed several times as i myself have done and others and then in writing and they have nothing right maury offers to further debate in writing i take it up nothing I write a point-by-point point refutation of all these assumptions put forth by these, these apologetic nuts. Nothing. <laughs> they just come back with the same dumb things I just responded to. And they won't even respond to things like what I wrote on John 118. So arguing with them is basically pointless. They're really like the scribes and Pharisees. I'm saying I'm starting out our reading today for this because I know that it's easy to get involved with these nuts because they pursue us, right? They're not out helping the poor. You're not going to see these Trinitarians and others trying to get people to come together and do certain specific Christ-like things, whether it's wash the feet of people who are infirm or lowly or help them in some way right help people who really need it not criminals liars and people who are just pretending to be weak they're out there these apologetic nuts like the scribes and pharisees they don't help anyone and they make it harder on them to go into the kingdom and they're not even going in and if they are if they're going in after <laughs> prostitutes and tax collectors so, I mean, that's how bad off they are, these debating nuts that love to come around and argue. I get them all the time. It's, to me, it's kind of funny right now, but I'm going to upload more things to give them more stuff to do. Maybe if I busy them up and remind them of their failures and how all their biggest, brightest, apologetic nuts have uh, been unable to defend their views consistently. I mean, it's over. I don't see how anyone could really watch those two debates and think that the Trinity came out in, like I'm talking about White and Bowman, or even with Maury. I mean, I just, none of what they had to offer is compelling and has a sense of necessity to believe, right? I mean, it's just like, what are you talking about? Why are you going this way? And this, these texts are clear. What's going on here? It's terrible. But I bring that up because I know it's easy to get involved with the nuts. <laughs> so this is my encouragement to you and my way of kind of presenting um, how I'm going to upload some further, I'll say, nutty material. I mean, it's good stuff. Those debates and things were for a purpose. They served a purpose. I respect White, Bowman, and Maury for being involved. Of course, their views are just, they, they dissolved. They have nothing. I don't see anything, right? I'm giving you my point of view, obviously. So they're entitled to theirs, you're entitled to yours, but I, I, in going over it again and preparing to upload these to the debate playlist and a lot of clips I saw, I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> and this was like what? This was back in um, 03, almost 20 years ago, like 17 years ago. So I mean, it's... <laughs> I've moved on in so many ways and can still advance those exact same things and then some, and they have nothing. I, I, so I understand though, it can get hard. Remember, a lot of people maintain their involvement with things just like with the Watchtower because you know they're trying to do what they think is right. And even if they see things in like, I'll use the Watchtower because that's where I'm, I come from in part, that are wrong, it's just not easy to stop being a part of something that you also think has some things that are right and that you're sort of connected to in life. 
So it's the same with Trinitarians. I call them nuts. I'm talking about the extreme ones, though, right? I'm not talking about just all Trinitarians. Not, of course not. I even talk about and propose <clears throat> working with Trinitarians who want to set aside these crazy debate things and focus on Jesus as the Son of God, help the poor, contradict things like evolution, teach proper morality, and stop letting these uh, gender-confused people take over the world. <laughs> That's what the Trinitarians have let happen. They're the ones who've been running the show, right, religiously? Well, what's going on, Trinitarians? What are you doing? I mean, it takes someone like Trump, who's not even really a religious person, to get things done on some level against these satanic pedos? Where have you people been? Where have the Trinitarian politicians been? I don't know. I guess they've been arguing with us, right? Too busy arguing with us, fellow Christians, people who believe Jesus is the Son of God. Too busy with us than to go deal with these pedos and Satanists. And I'm not saying Satanists can't believe in Satan. I'm talking about pedo Satanists. <laughs> the ones who sacrifice children after pedoing them like we see with certain groups and people today. So, but I'd be careful with any Satanist, right? He resists Ja, she resists Ja. You wanna to work together at a job, fine. You watch your back, I watch mine because we don't follow the same beliefs. We can work together and do the company policy, great. But you make sure they don't deviate from that and set you up, they will. Any chance they can, I've had it happen to me. And speaking of that, I have another update on my fraud channel. I kind of pulled off one video because, as you know, those idiots, you know, they're so pathetic. But I, I got involved with my kids because I had one, one person who just, these people all work together, you understand? And the same thing. It's not just one person. It's like that video I showed on the fraud factory. But I don't, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep doing these things and reminding people I have a whole series I'm going to do on Sun Tzu and the art of insurance claims fraud. <laughs> Show how dumb those people are in terms of their obsession with committing fraud and how they don't even do it right according to the things they claim to try to do. It's dumb. And don't worry, I won't be helping them out. I'll just be showing how fraud is dumb. But, I mean, they're so far gone. It's like they're, they're, they're like the equivalent of the apologetic nuts on the non-religious criminal side. <laughs> So they're probably not going in ahead of the prostitutes either. <laughs> either way, let's get to the text. I have all these things coming up, so I'm giving you these updates. Don't worry, I never forget these things. The fraud channel, the property claims fraud review, that's like a secondary thing. I'm only doing that because I have to deal with all these criminals who continue to interfere with my life, my family. <laughs> And, of course, opposed Christianity. So there's just a lot of sick, disgusting people out there. And then we also have to deal with the religious nuts. So that's life. Oh, I can see Dada. He's over in the other part of the courtyard looking out the window. Either way, I say these things to remind you and so you also know what I'm involved with. But I haven't forgotten about the Property Claims Fraud Channel. I'll get back to that. But as I've been discussing, we're going to get to these debates, more clips from White, Bowman, more on Maury, all these things, man, they've done nothing. So if they're going to continue to pursue the things that are worthless, I'm going to continue to remind them they're done. And they have yet to respond to things as old as Trinitarian, Trinitarian the assumptions of Trinitarianism revisited. So... I get a lot of these nuts emailing me and I just keep posting them the same things. So I'm going to upload a lot of stuff, do those things, and then we'll also do the other shows. Now let's get to the reading. I don't always break for that long of a, a pre-reading intro, but I wanted to give a few updates, talk a little bit about all the, the nuts, and um, remind you not to waste your time with them, right? They're the least valuable in God's sight. They're the scribes and Pharisees, right? They don't get anything right. They couldn't even figure out that the Messiah would be more than David's son. Jesus had to remind them that David called him Lord. Psalm 110, 1. 
They don't get it. You understand? The text is right there. And they don't get it. It's not going to happen. And you're not going to make it happen. What you can make happen is plant in a person who doesn't know what to do yet. What you can is water in someone who's had that planted in them, who's learning what they should be doing, but doesn't quite have it figured out yet. These apologetic nuts, they have everything they need and they haven't figured it out yet. Why would you waste your time with them when you have that young girl, that young boy, that young man, that woman, then we're all looking for something to believe in. We have it. They don't. If they did, they'd be out there talking about it. Instead, they're arguing with us. Let's get to these texts. Revelation 20, verse 1. I saw an angel stepping down out of heaven, holding the key to the unending world below or the endless empty pit or cell. And a giant chain was over his right hand. Verse 2, the angel arrested the dragon, the ancient serpent, who's also the devil, and Satan, the one who goes running around slandering other people, just like the apologetic nuts, and the resistor, who resists what Jod does, just like the scribes and Pharisees resisted his son. The angel tied him up for a thousand years. Verse 3, Then the angel threw the dragon into the unending world below, and the angel locked it, and he sealed the unending world below over the dragon, so he might not continue to deceive the nations until the thousand years should be finished. After these things, it's necessary to release the dragon for a short time. Verse 4, I saw thrones, and there were beings who sat down on them, namely the souls of those who were cut down because of the testimony about Jesus and because of the message about God. Can you think of any apologetic nut, Trinitarian in this case, who's been cut down because of his message about the Trinity? I can't really think of one. I can think of non-Trinitarian Christians who've been cut down by Trinitarians. It's strange when I read this text to think of how the Trinitarians would read this text. <laughs> Either way, the ones who argue with us all the time, that is. They're not doing this stuff. Right? Are they out there testifying and bringing the message of God to the point where they would be cut down? No. They're arguing with us. We wouldn't even see them or hear them if they were doing this stuff. Well, we might see them in the sense that they're being cut down, but not in arguing with us. These are those who did not bow low before the wild animal, nor before its image, and who did not receive its imprint upon their forehead or upon their hand, the beast, the image of the beast. These people came back to life and they ruled with the Christ for a thousand years. Verse five, the rest of the dead did not come back to life until the thousand years should be finished. This resurrection of those who were cut down because of the testimony about Jesus, because of the message about God, and because they did not receive the wild animal's imprint is the first resurrection. The first resurrection. Now let's think back to Paul, 1 Thessalonians 4. The dead who are in union with Christ will rise first. And then we, the living, who are in union with Christ, will be caught away. So here, he's talking specifically about those who were cut down. Now, to what extent this would also include those who are living and then caught away with the Christ when he returns? 
I, you know, I'm not going to get into it because it, the two aren't clearly the same, right? There seems to be a difference, or at least specifically here, it's talking about the ones who actually died, not the ones who continue alive. So it's possible that in Paul's case, he had in mind um, that there would be people alive who would be caught away and still be a part of this ruling class of people. That's kind of how the society views it, right? The Watchtower, that the anointed who are still living would be basically taken up a la Enoch and then be a part of this. But it, it is actually specific to those who were cut down, who came back to life. So it's also possible that the people Paul's talking about when he says that Jesus as the archangel, because Jesus has the trumpet, the call, and the voice that raised the dead, <laughs> just like he says in John 5, just like the trumpet raises the dead, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. These are all things raising the dead in the context of 1 Thessalonians 4. Yet, as we know, the apologetic nuts, they just, they collapse, right? When they get to 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17, all of a sudden their interpretive powers are gone. They can't, they, they just reject Jesus as the archangel there, or they will come up with the weirdest view of the voice there and disassociate it from the resurrection because they know that's an identifying action. See, they're so, uh, you know what word I want to say, right? They're so retarded. <laughs> they're spiritually retarded. They can't understand the text. Just like the Jews couldn't understand Psalm 110. What do you mean? What do you mean he's more than the Son? Oh yeah, he does call him Lord. Huh. What do you mean he's the archangel? Oh yeah, he does have the voice of the archangel. You see, it's the same thing. <laughs> it's never going to change. So why continue to not change, right? We move on. You're not going to change? Okay, how about you? How about you? How about you? This is what we do. This is what they do. <laughs> Verse 6, blessed, is, blessed and sacred is the one having a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no authority. Okay, so they can't die again. The ones who have been cut down and who come back to life and who rule with the Christ... And who sat down on these thrones, verse 4, they can't die again. But, as we know, it's talking about others here. And that's why I connected it with verses 12 and 13. But let's read the rest of 6. Instead, these same ones who can't die, who did die, they will be priests of God and of the Christ, and they will rule with the Christ for a thousand years. They cannot die a second time. Now, let's read about, let's read the rest of the text. Verse 12. I saw the dead, those considered important and those considered less important, having stood up before the throne. Then books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the one about life. Just like in Daniel, chapter 12, Michael the archangel, the dead were judged according to their works based on the records in the books. Verse 13, Then the sea brought forth dead people, the ones who were in it. And death and the world of the dead brought forth dead people, those who were in them. Each person was judged according to their works. These people were dead, and they can die again. They're being judged right here according to their works. Whereas the others are on the throne, they cannot die again. And as we know, what we're not reading in today's account, but the text goes on to describe how, or parts that we didn't read because of the translation um, sections, how the devil would be let loose for a short period of time, the part right before this that we didn't read, and that he would be allowed to basically assault the new earth and New Jerusalem, and, and encircle it, and then he would be destroyed and all who follow him. So, 
as you know, we don't get into detailed or required views of these texts, but let me just break this down to you a little bit. So we read earlier in Revelation 7 how there would be those sealed from the figurative tribes of Israel, or literal, you could say, but it appears to be figurative. And then there would be a great crowd, which no one can number out of all nations, in contrast to the spiritual Israel, New Jerusalem. Those, it said, would wash their robes and make them white, and God would be with them and, and extend his tent over them, and they would not cry or thirst anymore. Just like in Revelation 21, the new heavens and new earth, God's tent is with mankind. And so when the devil is let loose, he's allowed to mislead mankind that have gone through the great oppression and populated the earth, the earth to the extent that it can now reflect what John intended and then the devil is let loose to test it once again in this state after which he and those who follow him are destroyed and the rest remain forever on into the coming ages and it will then be fully completed so now, the only thing that doesn't fit, in my view, is this, the part where Paul talks about the living who survived to the presence of the Lord and how they would be caught away to be with the Lord. So, the only question that I can't fit in with these texts is the, the, what Paul is talking about and whether or not that involves actual death so that he would qualify or those he's talking about would qualify to be a part of the group here in Revelation 24 that appears to be limited to those who actually die because of their witness to Jesus which Paul did right so he may have thought because he wasn't given all knowledge right they were not made aware of all these things even the son didn't know so as far as they knew and everything happening you know, everyone should consider it as the end or their time of the end because it is our time and we are going to come to an end. We shouldn't overly state it or, or, or make people think that things are more than they are, but we should have a sense of awareness like they did. So, you know, that's the only thing that doesn't fit neatly to me in terms of the understanding that's expressed here in these texts. But it's possible that Paul either just didn't understand that he would have to die whether or not, you know, he may have thought that we'll keep living and that the end would come in his life and that he'd just be caught away. Because they obviously had some understanding of people continuing to live through a great oppression because that's the vision John was given. And they already knew of a new heavens and a new earth, right? They knew of the view and beliefs of the city having real foundations. And that it would bring about a condition for the earth that, that righteous people would inherit, just like Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount, just like it's taught in the Hebrew Scriptures. The new heavens and new earth is a concept all the way back from Isaiah to Revelation. It's not new. So we don't need to necessarily be able to fit in every view expressed by people like Paul in terms of the ultimate fulfillment of these texts and their death and what he was talking about. Um, so it's not important, right? We know the fact is that at some point we're either going to die or we're going to keep living. And if we keep living, it could be according to Revelation chapter 7 and then into the new earth, or it could be according to like what Paul talks about in 1 Thessalonians 7, caught away to the clouds in heaven with Christ. Let them decide. They're, it's all our hope. Someone asks you, what's your hope? What's your hope? New heavens and new earth. To be with God in Christ, to rule on earth or to rule in heaven, or to do what the ones who are ruling say, right? We know that it says here, people sit down on thrones in heaven and rule, just like in Revelation 2 and 3 and 5, 9 and 10. And we know that people, the kings of the earth, bring their glory into New Jerusalem. Revelation 21 and 22. Here come the cats. So it doesn't, you don't have to have a specific expectation 
Who we don't we're not supposed to know exactly everything we're gonna do. We know enough. We know there's gonna be a lot of stuff. New heavens, new earth, lots of cultivation, lots of healing for the nations, kings of the earth, kings and priests in New Jerusalem, the Son of God, and Jah himself lighting up the earth, his footstool. That's good enough for us. That's all we need to know, right? What else do we really need to know? We don't even really need all that detail, right? That's like bonus stuff. Not all the early Christians knew this, right? They didn't get to read what John was given here. They may have known about it or talked about it like we just did in relation to New Heavens, New Earth thinking and the beliefs of the ancient peoples about a city having real foundations. But they didn't get the kind of descriptions that we're getting here. Not the ones who died before John, the Christians. So, this is good stuff. It's more than we need. It's more than enough. And if we keep going and we do the things that we know we were made to do, then the God who made us to do those things, the one who is true, will give us the opportunity to keep doing those things to his glory. Right? That's what he cares about. Remember what Jesus said? I'm not seeking my own glory. There is one who's seeking. And what did Paul say that Jesus was given the name above every name to? The glory of God the Father. He is seeking that glory. The Son knew that. The devil knows that too. He tries to create friction between them, in my view, and part by the Trinitarian apologetic nuts because they, they constantly argue about the two that they're supposed to be promoting in love. They don't see it. Either way, I hope you see it. And I hope you see it because you believe it based on the best available reasons. So enjoy the rest of your Friday. I gave you a few updates at the beginning of the show about a couple coming debates. I'm going to upload the White and Bowman debates over the next couple weeks. Lots of clips that I saw I'm going to use. And of course, the written material on my blog that none of these apologetic nuts have responded to, even in part. But I mean, it's, it's pretty devastating. So I just, what are they going to say, right? But they don't even accept what Jesus says. So who cares what I say? If you can't get them past John 10 and Jesus' use of gods to justify their, that he is a god and that their accusation was false, well, why do you think they're going to believe you? Why do you think they would believe me? If they don't believe Jesus, well, then they're just not really interested in Christianity, right? They may talk it. It's just like the Jews and Pharisees who opposed Jesus in his day. They obviously weren't really interested in finding the Messiah. They were interested in what they believed about the Messiah. It's the same thing today. So it's up to us to recognize that in other people, though, so that we don't give away our oil. We only have so much. You're going to spend that oil on these apologetic nuts? Or are you going to spend your oil building your association of brothers and sisters in love, helping your family who may need it, and all those other people who have yet to believe it? That's what I recommend.